Hello! In this lecture, we'll discuss what the solar system looks like and what we can learn by comparing the planets to one another. We'll also do a survey of our solar system from the Sun all the way out to Pluto and Eris. It wasn't until quite recently that we've been able to get close-up images of the planets and other objects in our solar system. The first planetary probes were launched in the 1970s, giving astronomers views that would surpass anything a ground-based telescope could give. I can only imagine what Galileo would think if he could see one of the high-resolution images of Jupiter the Voyager probes have given us. Before we get to the individual planets, let's look at the solar system overall. All the planets have nearly circular orbits going in the same direction and in nearly the same plane. It's counterclockwise if viewed from above. Most large moons orbit their planets in the same direction, which also happens to be the direction of the sun's rotation. There are eight major planets with nearly circular orbits. Dwarf planets like Pluto and Eris are smaller than the major planets and can have orbits that are quite elliptical. This is an artist's impression of what the sun would look like in Pluto's sky. From this far away, the sun looks like any other star, but of course to us, the sun is quite special, as are the planets and the other objects that orbit it. Comparing the planets reveals patterns among them, and those patterns provide insights that help us understand how our own solar system came to be. There are a lot of facts and figures about each planet here and in the text. Please don't get hung up on memorizing numbers about each world, unless of course that's what makes you happy. Instead, try to keep a larger view. Focus on the elements that are common to multiple planets and the things that are different. At the beginning of the semester, we looked at the sizes of solar system objects to scale. Here they are again. The distances, of course, are not to scale. We're going to start our solar system journey with the sun and move from the inner planets to the outer planets. Now, hopefully this isn't too childish, but here is a mnemonic to remember the ordering of the planets. Mary's violet eyes make John stay up nights. There are many others. This is just the one that I was taught when I was a young sprout. Here we go, starting with the sun. Well, it's enormous. It looks solid, but it's actually a turbid sea of hot hydrogen and helium gas. The sun's energy comes from nuclear fusion reactions that take place deep within the core. This is an extreme ultraviolet imaging telescope image showing a huge handle-shaped prominence on the sun. And on to Mercury. Mercury is a desolate, cratered world with no active volcanoes, no wind, no rain, and no life. Because there is no air to scatter sunlight, if you stood on Mercury with your back toward the sun, you could see the stars even during the day. Mercury is also a world of hot and cold extremes. The days and nights on Mercury last about three months each. Venus is nearly the same size as Earth. It rotates on its axis very slowly and in the opposite direction as Earth, so the days and nights are very long and the sun will rise in the west and set in the east. It has an extreme greenhouse effect caused by the planet's carbon dioxide, and this keeps the surface of Venus very hot, almost 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Earth is the only known oasis of life in our solar system. Earth is also the only known planet in our solar system with oxygen to breathe, o ozone to shield the surface from deadly solar radiation, and abundant surface water. Uh, we also have a surprisingly large moon. Mercury and Venus don't have any moons, and almost all the other moons throughout the solar system are much smaller relative to the planets that they orbit. Mars is the last of the four inner planets. It's larger than Mercury and our moon, but only about half of Earth's size, and its mass is about 10% that of Earth. Mars has two tiny moons, Phobos and Deimos. Mars has many interesting features, enormous ancient volcanoes, a huge canyon, and 
polar ice caps made of frozen carbon dioxide and water. Although Mars is frozen today, the presence of dried up riverbeds, rocky floodplains, and minerals that form in water offer us evidence that Mars had at least some warm and wet periods in the past. Mars surface looks almost Earth-like, but if you went there without a spacesuit, you would die. There's not enough oxygen, it's freezing, and there is no ozone. This is a view from the Spirit rover on Mars. To reach Jupiter from Mars, we have to travel a distance that is more than double the total distance from the Sun to Mars, passing through the asteroid belt along the way. Jupiter is a lot different than any of the inner planets. It's much larger with a mass 300 times that of Earth. It has a famous red spot that's large enough to swallow two or three Earths. It's primarily hydrogen and helium and has no solid surface. If we plunged deep into Jupiter, the increasing gas pressure would crush us long before we ever reached its core. Jupiter also has dozens of moons and a thin set of rings. Most of Jupiter's moons are quite small, but four are large enough that we'd call them planets or dwarf planets if they orbited the sun independently. These four moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, are often called the Galilean moons because Galileo discovered them. They display a varied and interesting geology. This image here is from Voyager 2 and shows Io in front of Jupiter's turbulent clouds. I want to mention just a few things about the Galilean moons. First, Io. One of the most surprising discoveries of the Voyager 1 mission was the violent volcanoes that were found on Jupiter's moon Io. And here is another image from Voyager 2. This one is of Europa. Europa has an icy crust that may hide a subsurface ocean of liquid water, making it a very promising place to search for life. Ganymede 2 may have subsurface oceans. Callisto is basically a ball of ice and could also have oceans underneath. Moving beyond Jupiter, it's quite a long journey to get to Saturn. Saturn orbits nearly twice as far from the Sun as Jupiter. Saturn is the second largest planet, but it is the least dense. It would float in a bathtub if you could find a bathtub big enough. Saturn is made mostly of hydrogen and helium and has no solid surface. It's famous for its spectacular rings, which are made of countless small particles, each of which orbit Saturn like a tiny moon. They range in size from dust grains to city blocks. Uranus lies twice as far from the Sun as Saturn. Uranus is much smaller than either Jupiter or Saturn, but much larger than Earth. It's made of hydrogen and helium and hydrogen compounds like water, ammonia, and methane. It's the methane gas that gives Uranus its lovely blue-green color. Like the other giants of the outer solar system, Uranus lacks a solid surface. More than two dozen moons orbit Uranus along with a set of rings. The entire Uranus system is tipped on its side compared to the rest of the planet, so it looks sort of like it's rolling along on its orbit around the sun. Neptune looks similar to Uranus, although it's more blue in color. It's a little smaller and a little more dense. It has rings and numerous moons. Its largest moon, Triton, is larger than Pluto and maybe one of the most interesting moons in the solar system. Triton's icy surface has features that appear to be somewhat like geysers that spew nitrogen gas into the sky. Triton is also the only large moon in the solar system that orbits its planet backward, that is in a direction that's opposite to the direction in which Neptune rotates. Here are close-ups of the clouds on Neptune from Voyager 2. Finally, we end our tour at Pluto. For 75 years, Pluto was our ninth planet. The 2005 discovery of Eris and the fact that dozens of other recently discovered objects are not much smaller than Pluto and Eris 
led scientists to reconsider the definition of planet. The result is now that we consider Pluto and Eris to be dwarf planets, too small to qualify as official planets, but large enough to be round in shape. The image here is of an artist's uh, concept showing the Pluto system from the surface of one of the smaller moons. I'll end this lecture with another artist's take. This is a view from Europa of Jupiter. Europa is an interesting place. The ice and rock from which Europa formed would certainly include the necessary chemical ingredients for life. And Europa has internal heating that would be strong enough to power volcanic vents on its sea bottom. It's easy to imagine volcanoes on Europa's ocean floor that look like Earth's undersea volcanoes. Europa seems to have all the ingredients needed for life. Perhaps someday we'll know for certain if there's life down there. That's all for now. I'll talk to you soon.